Hi, good afternoon. My name is Shona McAnally and I'm currently a volunteer at Red Hall Walled Gardens. It's a project that's run by Sam H for adults who have suffered from mental health issues. I'm here today to represent a voice that is often not heard due to the very nature of mental illness and how incapacitating it can be. I want to share with you a bit of my journey through mental illness and trying to obtain benefits in the current climate. I hope if there are any politicians out there that they listen because this is not just my story, it belongs to the countless faceless, courageous individuals who struggle with a mental illness every day. In my previous life, as I like to call it, I was a respected senior social worker on a very good wage. We had all the necessary material goods that make a home and money for me was never an issue. I earned enough to feed myself, my son, and to look after all of our needs. We ate a balanced, nutritious diet, and every week I would meet up with friends, I would go to the gym, or I went horse riding. All of these things kept me well mentally and physically. I was able to define who I was. My roles were clear. I was a mother, a daughter, a sister, a friend, and a colleague. I knew who I was and where I was going in my life. That all changed in 1996. I was standing in front of a jury trying to prosecute people from Quarrier's Children's Home where I was brought up. Their crimes ranged from child cruelty and neglect to attempted murder and gang rape. We were successful in one person being prosecuted but two men were able to walk free as there had been a mix-up in the time police interviewed them in their appearance at court. From there life was never quite the same. As well as this, I also had to go under what major surgery. My world collapsed around me. I became frightened to be alone, frightened to be with people. I couldn't eat, sleep, as terrifying thoughts that I may die played around my head. These thoughts came from the past, images of the repeated violence and overwhelming terror I felt as a child. Mental illness tightened its grip on me as the trauma of my past caught up. I became a stranger to all who knew me, including myself. I made several attempts to kill myself as I felt the trauma in my head was too much to deal with. My son had no idea where his strong, capable mother had gone and I was eventually sectioned. Time passed and in amongst the fog came the realisation I had no more wages or savings left, but myself and son still needed to eat and have a roof over our head and the thousands of other things that people need to survive. I was too ill to work and I still couldn't be on my own and had to be drugged to be in the company of others. It was a truly interesting combination. I duly called the Benefits Agency and it was for me the start of a very long journey to be recognised as a genuine claimant and a very painful introduction into having to learn to listen without interruption while faceless voices spoke to me like I was stupid or unworthy. I was told on more than one occasion that I should just get back to work as I was an educated woman. I can honestly say at that point in my life I didn't feel like any woman, never mind an educated one. I felt nothing except isolation, terror and a growing belief that I was also a bad mother as I couldn't even manage to get benefits for myself and my child to survive. I was told I would need to come in and have an interview and that I would need to bring my missive of let, my last three wage slips, my last four bank statements including the most current, my birth certificate, my son's birth certificate, a letter from his college as proof of his attendance, my P45, my letter of resignation to work, a letter from my psychologist and one from my GP to prove that I was genuinely ill. This felt like a monumental task as I had been so ill for so long and I had no idea where these papers were and if indeed I had even kept them. I told them that I could not attend a meeting as I was too ill and I was told very bluntly that I either came or I got no benefits. Faced with this choice, I fell apart and called my support worker saying that I didn't think I could go to the meeting and I was terrified that I would die if I did. This was from the woman who used to travel all over the world and write research in her spare time. After borrowing money from family, my support worker finally had to speak with the benefits agency and with my permission tell them my story. And only after they had all the gory details was I deemed ill enough for a home visit. I felt exposed, pitied, judged and a total failure that I could not manage a meeting or fill in the forms myself. Finally, I was paid incapacity benefit and the lowest rate of care for DLA. Although a meagre amount, it enabled me with support initially to start getting out of the house and then eventually to attend Red Hall Walled Gardens as a volunteer. 
These two things have been instrumental in my road to recovery and I have been able to get out of my house and with support start to trust the world again. If I hadn't had the money to get to Red Hall, I would never have met two wonderful women, Linda from Wester Hills Health Project and Jan Cameron from Red Hall Wall Gardens. They helped save my life and let me believe that there is always hope that recovery is possible. There is already little enough money and benefits, let alone money to ensure people can socialise, get to projects, eat a balanced diet or even get out for a cup of tea and all the other things that normal people do to keep well and happy. Maybe I should get out and walk, I hear you say. Well, I do, but unfortunately I have a neurological disease that limits this and, I, and it can often be lonely on your own. It may seem a frivolous ask to those of you who work, why should your tax pay for my cup of coffee or to attend a project? My answer is this, that cup of coffee or bus fare could help me on my route to recovery and also play a vital part in saving mine and countless others' lives. The importance of being able to get out, even if it is with support, cannot be measured by money. Social isolation hinders recovery and as people begin to come through the other side of mental illness, socialisation and physical activity are two things that can speed up the recovery process. It allows people to build back up self-esteem and confidence, all of which has a positive effect on the recovery. Mental illness is not a life or career choice. It can happen to anybody, but that does not mean we should be penalised, stigmatised, left in doubt about our financial future or be made to feel we have limits put on our restrictions for our recovery. The government appears to have no grasp on the realities of living with a mental illness. This bill will affect an already marginalised and often misunderstood group of people. People with mental health issues form many thousands of individuals in our society, often too ill to speak up for themselves, the unseen part that humanity still does not want to recognise as human beings and humans living in the 21st century. It strikes me as odd that in our lifetime one in four of us will suffer from a mental health condition, yet there still appears to be a social belief that only people who are on the poverty line live on estates or have addictions are susceptible to being mentally ill. The truth is far more daunting. Thank you.